we have come to assume that we are equipped with sensory perceptions by which it is possible for us to have a reasonably complete awareness of the world outside of ourselves. We know that this awareness has some limitation. We realize that beyond a certain distance, our vision fails. And sounds too far away cannot be distinctly heard. We also realize that our sensory perceptions may be variously restricted. It is quite possible for the individual to lose keenness of sight or acuteness of hearing or have any of the sensory perceptions impaired. It has not occurred to us, generally speaking, however, uh, to take the possibility into consideration that the sensory faculties of man are also in a process of evolution like all parts of his nature. Therefore, that in the course of time, all of these faculties may be more acute, more complete, more adequate than they are at the present of time. All things granted, considered, however, we live as though these faculties gave us a full and reliable report on the environment in which we exist. We do not like to believe that perhaps there is a whole world of things beyond our sensory perception or outside of our ability to understand. There is one simple way, however, that we can demonstrate this to ourselves and to almost anyone's satisfaction. We live on a part of this planet which we call dry land. We are surrounded by oceans. The average person has no hope of ever actually seeing below the surface of these oceans. Perhaps if he's a keen swimmer, he may be able to see 25 or 50 or 100 feet below the surface of the water. Or with certain scientific equipment, he may be able to descend into some of the deeper places. But what we do not realize, any of us really, is that the world beneath the surface of the sea is far more complex than the one on which we dwell as dry land. There are more forms of life in the ocean than there are on the land. The population of the seas is greater than the population of the earth. Yet most of the creatures in this vast, unknown, dim, or dark region, we know nothing about whatever. Yet they are here, they are alive, they are fulfilling their patterns of life. They are very close to us, but hopelessly separated because of the difference in constitutions and the difference of the necessary elements in which these two forms of life in general have to dwell. So we can say quite honestly that we will never, certainly in this life, see even a half of the creation which we call the physical earth. Part of it will be explored a hundred years from now part of it probably 10,000 years from now. But still there will always be things that we cannot see, mysteries that we cannot immediately solve, spaces that our sensory perceptions will not penetrate. We also know that our very sensory structure 
has boundaries, has natural and inevitable restrictions upon uh, the function of these faculties. We know beyond doubt that there are sounds that we cannot hear. There are odors that we cannot smell. It is perfectly possible for us to contract or make devices by means of which we can call animals because they can hear sounds that we cannot hear. We therefore know that even humble creatures, rabbits and squirrels, are probably hearing sounds that we will never be able to experience. In the same way, sight is a most restricted instrument of penetration. It becomes practically useless at night. We have only a very limited ability to actually see but we have come to adjust ourselves to the limitations of our faculties and gradually, like a half-blind person, we grow accustomed to the twilight in which we live and are not even concerned whether there be more light elsewhere or not. Distances, of course, also contribute to this mystery. Well, some things are so far away, like other planets and stars, that we can form with our faculties no adequate comprehension of their natures and structures. We have invented all kinds of scientific instruments to assist us, to support us, to intensify sounds and colors and odors so that they may be more quickly uh, sensed by us. But even these instruments are utterly inadequate and must always be. The only answer that we can really face with a certain amount of integrity is to admit that we are limited creatures and that in comparison to our own limitations, we are living in an almost unlimited universe that there are many, many types of life that are perfectly real and valid, which we cannot experience. Now, this presents a number of interesting problems, and our ancient forebears thought about these mysteries considerably. One thing that we all experience is the appearance of certain forms or circumstances within the area of our comprehension from some source outside of this area. Things seem to happen. Situations arise. And it seems as though invisible hands are moving the elements of some gigantic chess game. We are aware constantly that from the unseen there are flowing forces which are of importance to us within the narrow range of our own existence. We wonder sometimes to what degree these invisible factors influence or even overshadow our conduct here. Our most ancient ancestors considered that the invisible atmosphere around us was populated with creatures. And these creatures became so real to these older peoples that we could never possibly have convinced them that such beings were figments of imagination. The Greeks have populated the whole universe with living beings which men cannot see. Every fountain had its nymph. Every grove its dryad or hamadryad. The mountains and the valleys, the clouds, all things were alive with life. And the Romans went so far as to have their kitchen gods that lived under the hearth 
They had spirits for everything, and so did the old Chinese peoples. In other words, the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians and most Oriental nations recognized a populous universe filled with beings and forms of life that we cannot normally perceive. The highest and most august of these forms of life were considered to be deities, gods, demigods, and godlings of various orders and kinds. Even St. Paul describes hierarchs of beings invisible to us. An early Christian religious art is resplendent with cherubs, archangels, and angels, mysterious beings that we do not see, but certainly were meaningful to the artists of the Middle Ages. Also, these older peoples could not but take for granted uh, that nature, with its manifold structure, might very well sustain evolving forms of life similar to our own. Many different creatures can live in the same place at the same time so long as the structures of these creatures are dissimilar. Two natures of similar structure cannot occupy the same place. But if the structure is different, if the elements of one body can move through the elements of another without interference, then we have no way of knowing whether other forms are present or not. And Socrates certainly held it to be a reasonable hypothesis that just as surely as men live in their own dimensions, fulfilling in the world of their own vibratory polarization, all of the mysteries of existence. So there might well be other peoples living along the shores of the air or within the deep mysteries and fields of space, just as real as we are. And in this case, these other creatures, by the most sober reflection, may have come to the conclusion that we do not exist. It all depends on the point of view. And if this point of view is different, uh, we are isolated by this separateness of attitude or belief. Now, it certainly would normally appear uh, that the belief uh, that there are other kinds of life close to us, uh, pertinent to our affairs, would have to be supported by some kind of evidence. Man uh, just doesn't believe these things for no reason at all. And probably the kind of evidence that has most commonly arisen is the result of internal experiences by certain persons. There has been considerable record that human beings may, under certain conditions, seem to experience dimensions of perception not commonly distributed among us. The visions of saints, uh, the ancient meditations of sages and seers, the testimonies of saviors, all these would seem to sustain that some persons have a more extensive faculty perception range than others. Also, it would appear that this ex extrasensory band can be developed to some degree, that the individual may be able to intensify this subjective power to know or to intuit, or to sense, or to know by some strange faculty of inner vision something of the world that is normally concealed from us. We know that as prosaic 
and common thought a man as Socrates. Distinctly described his daemon, a spirit which accompanied him and did not depart until shortly before his, the death of Socrates. Socrates believed that this daemon really existed. And from every part of the dialogue, it would appear that he saw him, conversed with him, and knew him. Now we can say that Socrates was mistaken, that he was deluded, and perhaps because of the curious nature that he possessed, might well have been neurotic, or suffered from some strange aberration, or some division of personality. But whether he did or not, has never been satisfactorily demonstrated. But Socrates is only one of thousands who have reported these things. From old times to the most recent day, in East and West, everywhere, there are streams of accounts that under some conditions, certain persons are able uh, to see beyond the ordinary limitations of our sensory perceptions. From these we have received also accounts of unusual or mysterious beings or situations, places, dimensions of time and thought. In this uh, phase of our problem, therefore, we can say that our belief in the existence of these other dimensions and their creatures, this belief has been built from the testimony of our own kind, which is the only point we want to make at the moment. It seems that we have gradually come to believe this out of our own experience. The next point that perhaps is of interest is the fact that for the majority of human beings, such experiences are not natural, normal, or common. Therefore, to most persons, uh, there may be a certain psychological sensing that we live surrounded by invisible forces or conditions. But we really have no valid understanding of what these forces may be. Again, older nations and ancient peoples believed that they could link the two worlds by the mystery of sleep. In sleep, men dream, and in their dreamings they seem to mingle the natural and the unnatural, the normal and the supernormal, in strange fantasy. Some dreams are so real that they are more uh, intense than experiences of waking. And in dreams, men see many things. And in trances, and in various comas, strange experiences are recorded. Sometimes, these dream experiences are rather unhappy, and we call them nightmares. Our ancient forebears would never have considered nightmares to be merely hallucinations. They would consider them to have been journeys into the unseen realm. We no longer feel this way about it. But we never have as yet clearly interpreted or solved the riddle of dream experiences. We only assume that we have. This adds up to one point. Most individuals who are happy, normal, reasonable people, well-adjusted with society, are not much inclined to dream. And if they do, they have but very slender memory of their dreaming. Some research would indicate that perhaps we all dream whenever we sleep. But we do not remember. The pressure of these dreams is not great enough to burden us with any continuance or to be carried forward into our waking state. Therefore, the dreamer is most apt to be a neurotic. 
He is apt to be under pressure of some kind. Perhaps his dreaming will have the hallucination of narcotics. Perhaps he will be suffering from some minor form of delirium tremens. Uh, dreams of this nature are proverbially unpleasant. Perhaps it is only worry or grief or the natural dissipations of our minds and emotions that contribute to our dreaming. But it is evident that most dreams represent an abnormal condition within the psychic integration of the individual. As a result of this, a large part of dreaming is not especially pleasant. Also, it is tied to strange beliefs and fantasies that we hold within our own thinking. As a result of the neurotic pressure in dreaming, it may well be that we have gradually developed over a great period of time a sense that this other world that we cannot normally reach is a negative, evil, destructive, sad, or burdened abode. The ancients considered, to be, considered it to be the dwelling place of the shadows of the dead. And the shadows of the dead, as Homer tells us, were a melancholy lot. In those old days, there was no concept of heaven as we know it. It was simply the disembodied soul wandering in the strange gray land of a twilight zone, a region to be found only by dreamers in the grayness of the early dawn. Ghosts haunted this region, uh, carrying on their unfulfilled desires as best they could, or seeking some way to revenge themselves upon the enemies they had left behind. It was a world of hauntings and a world of doubts and fears. And the more people thought about it this way and the more negative they became, uh, the more negative their dreaming. Until in time we have come to more or less populate this invisible region around us with menace, with danger, with terrors, with things by nature harmful. Uh, destructive or disturbing in one way or another. However it came about, this we know, that man has never, for some reason, had an optimistic attitude about the unknown. He has never enjoyed it. He has never instinctively believed that invisible forces around him were angelic. He may have suspected that an angel might be floating around there somewhere, but for every angel, there were a hundred imps, devils, goblins, and ogres. Children uh, seem so easily frightened, and they are frightened by intent. And very often adults use the child's imagination in an effort to control the child by frightening it. And these fears have their place later in the psychology of things. Religions have done the same thing. They have populated space with a hierarchy of evil spirits. They have held, more or less, that invisible to man but ever near were the forces of negation, ready ever to close in upon the sinner, forever waiting to pounce upon the individual who was late to Mass. This has always been the situation. And little by little, our subconscious, which is the memory of our folk experience, has developed a kind of psychic defense against invisible things. No matter how much we have believed that the universe was the handiwork of God, we have never been quite sure that evil spirits did not walk the earth at night. The moment darkness came, the moment our sensory perceptions were useless, or the moment we entered into a state of existence in which our sensory perceptions were inadequate, that which lay beyond them was always a little bit terrifying. Always man 
considered his own center of consciousness as his protector. And he lived to defend himself with the little light in his own soul against darkness on the assumption that darkness was evil. That whatever was out there was not good for him, not well-intentioned toward him. We have gone so recently through this epidemic of fear of invasion from other planets and so on that we see even how science fiction in devising its fables always has some evil and terrible force that must be met and overcome by man, the hero, in one of his innumerable forms. Always there is something out in the darkness that wants to swallow up hope, swallow up goodness, destroy and injure. While this has been true, especially, I think, of Western man over a long period of time, it was not essentially quite so true of those peoples who really belong to what we term today pantheistic religions. Pantheism uh, had a deep love of nature built into its structure. And people who loved the earth in its natural way, who regarded with the deepest admiration the sunrise and the sunset, who saw in everything beauty, to the degree that they achieved this within their own consciousness, they came more and more uh, to consider the invisible world as essentially kind. They did not have the same theological uh, fears that have afflicted Western man for the last several thousands of years. This means also that to these other peoples of other kinds and races and types, the principal phenomena of life were less uh, dangerous or less filled with fears and doubts. I think that the old pagans perhaps died with a better hope than most modern folks. Well, modern people are divided into two essential groups. One, who, one group which uh, believes in the possibility of an immediate perdition, and the other group which takes comfort in the concept of an inevitable extinction. Uh, these two groups have very little to be cheerful about. But so many of the older peoples looked on it differently. I've known several old American Indians who had a rather pleasant thought about the whole thing. They never thought of dying as going to some inevitable ultimate place where things were going to be very good or very bad. To them, dying simply meant to join the great tribe that had gone before. Uh, the old tribe, you could see them if you knew how. You could look out at night and see their campfires in the sky, for the stars were the campfires of our ancestors. The, it was all right. You went out, you joined those that had preceded you, you respected your parents, therefore you were not afraid to face them later. You expected your children to respect you, and when in some future day the old clan or the old tribe assembled again, everyone would get along. Uh, that was the way it was thought out. There, there were no great or horrible misgivings. There were no monsters over there. It was not so different from the world we lived in here, only perhaps the seasons were a little better, the hunting easier, not so much sickness, and everyone has lived longer without grayness coming or the body becoming bent with years. It was a, it was a going on of things which we have more or less lost. Now the effect of this difference in point of view certainly has influenced the psychology of the so-called sophisticated peoples of this generation. Because we have denied so much, 
because we have ignored what we could not understand and ridiculed the ways of our forebears, we have deprived ourselves of a heritage of peace, a subconscious acceptance of the universal good in all of its proportions. We have allowed ourselves to think that this universe created by a principle of good, sustained by a power of eternal right, uh, full everywhere with the love of God, could still be the hiding place of malignancies of all kinds, horrible and terrible things that might reasonably frighten not only the young but those of wiser years. By making this kind of a situation, we have opened millions of persons to negative superstitions. We have taken away from them the inner sense that the unknown must be good. And I put in its place the, the internal instinct to assume that the unknown must be dangerous. Little by little we have become afraid of the dark, even though in our philosophy we have sort of understood it and have realized that it wasn't really dangerous at all. So we have this world not too far away and not too close, a world which we have long felt to be full of living things. And the next question is, what are they doing? And that's quite a, a major consideration. A lot of people feel that the principal labor of the dead is interfering with the affairs of the living. This is, uh, this is uh, quite a common belief. Uh, the, the beings of the other world exist primarily to annoy us in one way or another. First of all, they annoy us by the fact that we can't see them and suspect that they exist. This is almost an insult in itself. For man confronted with something that he does not know is offended and his pride is deeply hurt. The second thing we sort of feel is always that in estimating any unknown circumstance, we are justified in asking the simple question, what does it mean to me? In other words, would we be at all interested in the possibility of an invisible universe of creatures unless we felt that this universe in some way impinged upon our own. Uh, we probably would not be particularly concerned if the little gnomes marched on forever, unless these little gnomes were guarding treasures we were seeking, or were able to confuse us in some way, or like the leprechauns were guarding pots of gold that we would like to own. Always we have to work ourselves into the picture in some aggressive manner, so that uh, our concern with the invisible universe is primarily what does it mean to us. Now the invisible universe we have also divided in the course of recent time into two distinctive parts. One might be termed a universe of possible living organisms. That is, creatures that might have forms or shapes or have empires or nations. The second type of thing that might be out there is simply force in one of its innumerable manifestations. Here are energies which we would like to know more about. Cosmic rays, all kinds of vibratory factors, a universe of closely interwoven energies, electric, magnetic, a universe filled with resources that perhaps we could use in one way or another, much as we have used electricity. One great motive, therefore, today in exploring this unknown world is in the hope that we shall find in it new sources of raw materials for the maintenance of our physical purposes. Perhaps sometime, if population problems become sufficiently intense, we may find it necessary to feed ourselves from the air. 
by extracting from what we would term empty space the vast charge of mineral magnetic substance which we know is there. We might also have to learn more about the rays of stars moving through space, understand better the, myst the mysteries of the transmission of sound and of color and forms as in radio and television. This invisible space around us, therefore, is a vast scientific potential. This potential is purely materialistic. It assumes that all these things exist, but that they are merely attenuated forms of the common things we know. Perhaps some of them are a little more distant from our comprehension, but to many people today, the unseen world is a vast, potential for scientific exploration. We don't expect to meet anyone out there, but we do expect to find in these mysterious dimensions about which we know so little today, new ways of preserving and extending our own empire. These are the things that we are most concerned with. This means, of course, that the philosophical or religious import of such considerations are left for mystics and idealists and dreamers to take on. And some do. We have had an increasing number of persons attempting, even on a scientific level, to justify the belief that we are going to actually find habitable zones in dimensions with which we are not even familiar at the present time. We consider it highly possible uh, that there may be dimensions of space and time in which vast orders of life, some infinitely greater than our own, may be evolving without awareness of our existence. If we are not aware of them and they are not aware of us, then these two worlds do not meet. But then the question arises again, is there any common ground of meeting outside of our sensory perceptions? Perhaps these worlds are nearer than we suspect, only as yet we do not consciously realize uh, the common ground. This could take us into psychology, for here we could explore the potentials of the mind as a possible meeting ground for vibrations and energies, thought patterns and pressures that have no equivalent in our outer experience. Some fictionalists and some more serious have tried to answer such questions as where do ideas come from? Do they really arise within our own gray matter? Or are there ideas in space that have a common existence? One question that has been asked frequently is a proper solution to the coincidence of great discoveries being made simultaneously in several places without any contact between the persons involved. It would seem as though there was a tuning in on pure thought substance. Musicians claim the same experience that they hear melodies that they will never be able to compose in the limited uh, instrumentality which we can provide. There are so many different ways in which it seems that an individual can be inspired, can receive strange insight, can sense perhaps foreknowledge, can anticipate the shape of things to come, can be given a prophetic spirit, or can be like the pithier of old, oracles of great tidings. What are the powers behind these things? Are they simply some neglected areas of ourselves? Or is there some region within our own natures in which we share or mingle with other worlds that we know not of? This has fascinated and intrigued human thinking since the very beginning. Now, against this situation, which we can face with a reasonable amount of common sense, if we really sit down and try to work with it, 
uh, we come also now against the rise of fantasy. Just as surely as we can write soberly of these unknown matters, so can we fictionalize, dramatize, or romanticize all such abstract types of thinking. So we have not only uh, some legends, some lore, some old believing, but we have a continuous supply of imagination by means of which we are constantly fashioning and shaping things, trying to fill space by imposing upon it the extensions of ourselves. Therefore, a great part of man's effort to describe the invisible world around him has simply been the extending of himself into it. Actually, this is not a factual approach. This is not real. But while it is not real, it is reasonably frequent. And in most cases, what we call the exploration of the invisible is simply a rationalization by means of which we try to make the invisible merely an extension of the visible. We try to uh, consider it merely a more attenuated earth, or another place where beings with temperaments and dispositions like our own have their habitations. And because these other creatures are like us, we have every just reason to be frightened to death of them. We suspect that they might do to us what we might well do to them. This has uh, produced a lot of psychotics, and it has done a great deal to damage the natural intuition of man. Somewhere, if we are to believe the old philosophers and the old mystics, there are faculties in man for the just investigation of these matters. Man can only investigate these things from his own structure. He will never invent a device that will be adequate. No matter how far he carries his present intellectual labors, and his scientific labors, he is never going to be able to achieve those things which are restricted to function of consciousness itself, because man cannot invent a mechanical equal to consciousness. He can develop exactitudes, but he cannot evolve creative machines. So that uh, the individual has to depend upon these inner resources. Now it is interesting, but whether he knows it or not, his own inner resources are the simplest approach to the matter. Infinitely less complicated than the extravagant method of experimentation for centuries trying to work out a device that never quite fulfills its purpose. Man, in order to find out what is anywhere, to understand anything, visible or invisible, uh, to clearly understand and know the substance of any reality, must have within himself the capacity to experience reality. Between him and this capacity is the vast structure of his own opinions. The, the way in, the key to the discovery of the truths of things, is always to have no preconception about them. A preconception is an invention. And a preconception in the subtle substances of thought becomes a molding force. And everywhere in life, that which we preconceive comes upon us. Whatever we expect, we experience. Not because it is true, but because it is expected. And from the mysterious substances of things which we cannot, analyze adequately. We are continuously seeing the reflected images of our own preconceptions about these things. 
Now, man is a creature of preconceptions. Man has never been a person or a being that by nature uh, sought first the facts of things. Man has always sought to prove that he is right. He has sought to defend opinion rather than discover truth. So even in the smallest daily problem that confronts him, he is always militantly determined to demonstrate his own rightness. And the only way in which he can do this is by creating a reflection or a contrast, by insisting that something else or someone else is not right. So in the search for whatever might be out in space, the discovery of the, of the situations or the substances or elements that may be there, the beginning of true discovery is to create an instrument that is not only sensitive enough to achieve the purpose, but is in itself in no way contaminated by any element or circumstance which will distort the validity of the report. Now, in man, there are many things that can distort the validity of any report. One, of course, is this opinionism. One is the conditioned faculties of his own thinking. Whatever impulses come to him, he will dress them immediately in his own expectancies. He has no other clear way of investing formless principles with cognizable formal structures. The uh, mystics of old, therefore, the saints and the hermits in the desert, have all begun with a simple formula, namely, that the individual who wishes to seek or find truth must first of all renounce worldliness. Now, by renouncing worldliness, by giving up lands and properties and titles and estates, by renouncing self-interest in all its forms, by departing from all appetites, from all ambitions and purposes, and retiring to live alone in poverty, or to dedicate one's life totally and unselfishly to the unremunerated service of others, for one purpose only, to serve truth, and without hope of reward or glamour, and without self-satisfaction, which is itself a delusion, the individual, being selfless, received according to the old stories the visions of truth, received the communion of the Spirit, and of such were the prophets to whom God spoke in the wilderness. So the, uh, the ancients took away from man every ulterior motive, by causing him to renounce anything which might bring satisfaction to himself. For only when he did this could the voice of God be heard. Well, we live in a different kind of world from that, but the principle remains essentially true, that man reaching out to experience the unknown universe around him must not have within himself any emotion or any attitude that is going to color uh, this experience. If he has any such conditioning circumstance, he will only reflect himself, and he will never know what was actually there. The very personal experience will obliterate the possibility of contact with something greater. If he therefore is convinced that this universe around him is full of fearful things, he will experience only its fearfulness. What its substance is, he will never know. For every demon he expects, he will find a demon. For every evil spirit that he believes to be there, he will find an evil spirit. Because he will find always what he expects, and in the magic mirror of space will see only his own face reflected. The only way to break through, then, is to reflect nothing from yourself, to have no preconception, to have no attitude, to have no feeling or belief about the thing. 
but to try with absolute sincerity to experience neutrally the nature of this thing itself. Now, to do this is not easy, and I would strongly advise no one to start on it late in the evening. <laughs> Actually, before it is possible uh, to explore these higher dimensions, as in the examples of advanced yoga, and in the higher disciplines of Tantra and even of Zen, long before the individual can attempt or should attempt any such exploration of things, he has the long task of self-preparation. It is utterly ridiculous for anyone to assume that he can approach the unknown with complete peace of mind at the present degree of his development. He must first go a long way in self-discipline before he, he is free from both fear and hope. For just as surely as the images of fear are but delusions, so most of the images of hope are likewise unfactual. So instead of, a, of an exploration, we simply live in a strange shadow world of our own expectancies, believing that we are greater than we are or less than we are, that we are in danger of some kind of strange punishment or an immediate hope of some mysterious reward. But actually, the true substance of this unknown condition is unexperienced. We do not have any concept of its true nature. The Buddha likened this final experience to the Mahaparanirvana itself. For in this absolute contact with space and eternity, we come into one with all the root and causal essences of things. We do not know what is there, but we know we must become like it uh, to experience it. And we know that as far as our own perceptions are concerned, this mystery is absolute quietude, absolute peace, absolute silence absolute rest. And until we find this in ourselves, we cannot walk through the curtains that divide the world. If we try to go in, in any other way, instead of passing into the other region, we merely pass into the negative abode of our own subconscious, and there we struggle with circumstances with which we should never have afflicted ourselves. So in this way, we try to summarize the first aspect of our problem which now sums up to the, the simple fact that with the exception of a few highly disciplined and highly conditioned people, uh, there is very little contact between these two conditions of space. There is very little contact between the worlds as we know them because the vibratory polarities are sufficiently separate that only occasionally is there a flash across this region or this realm. And such a contact is based upon some strange passing sympathy that comes and goes. It is a mystery. It is something that is lawful, but we do not understand its laws. For all intent and purposes, man has also been created with some kind of a defense mechanism and this was given to him on purpose. If it was primarily intended that man should be a citizen of two worlds simultaneously, he would be. If it was proper to his need at the moment that he should see this other side of place and space, he would. Also, if it was necessary or proper that he be continually molded or conditioned by forces dwelling out there, he would be aware of this process. But apparently it is not part of the original intent of things. It is not uh, a part of the purpose that man must presently fulfill that he should lean upon or be conditioned by this other region. Under certain conditions he may have a passing experience of it in dreams or in visions, 
but it is not his normal or proper abode. And if these visions be too numerous or are conferred upon those ill prepared to receive them, they lead not to helpfulness but gradually to disaster. So they're not needed. They're not part of the plan. We do not need the conscious participation in this other world. What we need and must develop is our ability to regulate and control and direct the affairs that we face here. It is therefore consistently demonstrated that the individual who becomes too much involved in the exploration of other dimensions is likely to become negligent of his immediate affairs. This is not good. For there is no amount that we can accomplish in the exploration of space that can in any way equal the needed experience of self-orientation here. It would seem, therefore, that the whole purpose of man and the peculiar structure with which he is endowed is that he be restricted, that he be held within a certain boundary, that this boundary shall reveal a certain part of the truth about the universe and himself, but not all of it that he shall see the entrances and the exits of this theater of life, but he shall not know what is going on behind the scenes, that under certain conditions the curtain is rolled up and the play goes on. But when the curtain is rolled down, man is not supposed to watch the changing of the scenery. Something has created a pattern for man. By this pattern he is set in a world of three dimensions, with faculties possessing certain penetrating power, with judgment and attitude. And it is assumed that he is provided here with all that is necessary for the immediate achievement of the reason for his own existence. If more was required, he would have it. But more seems only to be needed occasionally in the form of a great directive as in the revelation of a religion or something of that nature. It is not intended that there be continuous directives. And it is also so astutely operating that when a great seer does proclaim some mystery of the invisible world, the majority of human beings do not believe him. They are not affected by it simply because we are not affected by that which we do not ourselves experience in the final state of things. Thus, our immediate problem lies within a boundary, and the individual has been provided with a certain insulation. Under normal conditions, there is practically no evidence of any individual being persecuted by force outside of his own sphere of existence. There is no indication actually and factually that we have been invaded from some other dimension of space. This belongs to the world of science fiction. What has happened really always simmers down to our own ignorance and our own perverseness. So man having been given a certain insulation is by his own psychic nature protected against whatever vibratory rates pound in upon him from larger dimensions of space. He is protected in one of two ways. Either that he is capable of using his own psychic instrument as a kind of buckler or shield, an armor, by which he is able to deflect these rays, or else they pass through him, and, uh, and because he has no pole for them within himself, he is not aware of their existence, nor do they influence him. Man is therefore receptive only to a certain range of external pressures. Anything below this range or above this range is outside of his need, outside of the composite structure of his nature. Therefore, it is not evident that it has any effect upon him. 
So man having this limitation must have naturally wonder why. And the answer is certainly a very simple answer. That man's entire equipment, his entire instrumentation, the entire group of faculties and energies which he possesses, all of the structures of his psychoneural organism, all of these are bound up with a certain vibratory range. Within this range, the individual must live and move and have his being, for nothing outside of this range is of immediate utility to him. Such larger participation and in the cosmos as he may require is automatically provided for by nature itself, that he shall therefore receive his proper allotment of energy from the sun, or be receive what he needs from the various cosmic energies in space. Uh, this allotment is his inevitably. But for the rest, he is supposed to function within a certain range. And within this certain range, he has about all he can achieve. And ancient peoples recognize, therefore, that man already lives in two kinds of worlds, but that instead of these worlds being the physical universe as he sees it and the invisible universe around it, these worlds are actually the visible universe as he sees it and the invisible regions within himself. The, 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 the unknown world which must constantly concern the human being is his own inner life. And his own inner life is the symbol which he has attempted to justify by casting his reflection upon space. Space, the outside, the invisible universe around us, is merely a symbol for the unknown within us. And theoretically, in order to solve any region of the outside mystery, we must solve the corresponding region of the inside mystery. So the human being uh, has the same problem almost as the first remarks we made about the planet. As the planet consists of dry land and water, and the creatures of the sea are more numerous than those of the land. So man is also, even physically and psychophysically, two beings, a land body or a land creature composed of his external faculties and perceptions, and a creature of deep oceans, these oceans being the subconscious within himself. This subconscious is strangely populated. The inner life of the individual is far more mysterious than his outer. It is also more complex and more meaningful. But because we have lived in the objective side of our nature, almost since the dawn of our creation, and because also the faculties that we know are all more or less pointed outward to give us contact with environment but not with self, we have labored under the continuous disadvantage that we lack the organized, obvious means of exploring the one region which is the challenge we all must face. Everything, therefore, that we reflect upon the unknown around us is due to the distortions of the unknown within us. And this unknown within us has given rise to all the fears, all the doubts, all the uncertainties, all the griefs and grievances uh, with which we have attempted uh, to mutilate the outer universe. Every problem uh, that we fear on the outside exists only on the inside. This means that the individual from within himself is constantly releasing orders of mysterious beings. These mysterious beings are benevolent 
or evil creatures according to the qualities of our own thought emotional patterns that bring them into existence. But all of them become the mysterious inhabitants of sleep, the mysterious monsters of dreams and nightmares and visions. So the person attempting uh, to solve the mystery of himself by reference to the outside space is trying to continue to use the faculties with which he examines environment in the belief that if he can go far enough into the invisible around him, he will find cause. This he cannot do any more than he can find the cause of life by building a spaceship that could take him to the furthest star in our galaxy. He might learn in that way to understand that star, but the secret of life and of reality will be as far from him as it is today because he cannot travel outwardly to discover that which can be experienced only inwardly. Truth can be discovered only by experience. A man can experience nothing but himself. He can contemplate all kinds of things, but the vital experience of I know can only come from the internal uh, life of the person. So in the uh, next consideration that we have, is we have to think about man. Now, what kind of a creature is man? Man is visible and invisible. This we realize. His visible parts bind him to the known world. His invisible parts seem to unite him to the unknown world. And yet man is not part, really, of another kind of world, because what we call the unknown in this case is only that which transcends sensory perception. We have many references and accounts of the inner construction of man himself in relationship to the universe. Almost all of these accounts finally agree that man himself is a kind of miniature world, and that just as surely as the solar system was believed theologically to consist of heaven, earth, and hell, so man is likewise a triad, consisting of a divine nature, a human nature, and a strange shadowy sub-nature, which was his inferno, and which has always tormented him and always will. And it is this inferno uh, which he must uh, some way cope with, and in the ancient writings, we are told, for instance, that Jesus, after the crucifixion, descended into limbo and redeemed the souls of the lost. In other words, he descended into the infernal region. In Buddhism, the same concept is uh, described, in which the Buddha uh, is said to have multiplied his nature so that he appeared simultaneously in all of the 49 realms of Avicii, or the underworld, and there redeemed the souls of the dead. And the uh, presence which he left behind when he left these regions was the lotus, which to all these became the symbol of eternal hope. But this Avicii problem, this whole problem of the under-region, means that the individual, in order to attain freedom, particularly from the cycle of transmigratory existence, has to redeem his own underworld. Now, in attempting to redeem his own underworld, he is in exactly the same problem as the medieval, who saw this underworld around him, lapping upon the very steps of the cathedral. He was only able to hide in sanctuary or tuck himself under the edge of some bishop's robe to avoid perdition before the day was out. This uh, world of evil closing in upon medieval man, bringing with it the Inquisition, the witchcraft problems, the cycles of demonology which caused thousands of innocent persons to die, this whole situation finally traces it back, itself back to the sub-regions of man's own nature. 
For there is in every individual this region of negation, uh, this region into which is constantly flowing the endless mistakes of living, this region which is kept alive by the errors of life, this region in which everything that is negative, everything that is destructive, everything that is selfish, uh, continues on to create psychic vortices, vortices which the ancients like to think of as demons, um, various elementaries of negative and horrible proportions. But man was creating out of his own negation a, a hierarchy of infernal monsters. These are the ones which he gives a certain life to by vitalizing them with his own thoughts, with his own intensities, with his own emotions, sustaining them by his own self-willfulness, by the bitterness of his attitudes, by his criticism and condemnation. These things are constantly building evil. Now, back in the Paracelsian days, it was assumed that if we kept doing this long enough, if we kept building this corruption into our own subconscious, it would become very much like a corrupted land. It would be a place in which plagues might well arise. And many of the ancient peoples believed that what we call germs and bacteria and things of this nature are really manifestations of this psychic evil that lurks within things. That the destructive forces of life which take form in lower kingdoms are in reality the embodiments of the negative psychic pressures of living things. That they are the devourers, the destroyers, the corruptors of flesh. And that therefore the individual may interpret this in two ways. Either that perhaps sickness physical sickness is caused by this gradual increasing pressure of negation in the subjective part of self, or else that this negation becomes a swarm of semi-living elementary creatures, and that these creatures, like strange fungus, or like mysterious uh, cre um, creatures, parasites, can take hold of and drain the body of its resources and the mind and heart of their values and energies. In any event, the ancients held it to be self-evident that man carries within himself this region of his own undoing, and that his first and real purpose is to solve this, that this is his own underworld, the mysterious eighth sphere of the Gnosis, this world which has really no existence, but is continually forced into the seemingness of existence by the seemingness of evil in the deeds and thoughts and emotions of living things. Thus, uh, in the Persian philosophy, we have the war between light and darkness, but light is ultimately victorious. And in the struggle between all good and all evil in the nature of things, truth is ultimately victorious. For it is truth and truth alone uh, that can set us free. And truth in this case represents always the disciplines of a doctrine of integrity by means of which we drain this swamp of its corruptions. So in the uh, older philosophies and so on, it was assumed that whatever evil man saw around him was but the shadow of the unconquered negation within him, that he was forever projecting this negation out into space, that this negation by projection invested itself with countless forms, some of which come back upon man in hideous proportion, such as war, crime waves, great pestilences, and outbreaks of nature. And nearly every war in history has been followed by a plague, because in many ways 
war set up these terrible hatreds which in the invisible atmospheres of our lives corrupt the flesh and cause us to sicken from within. When great numbers sicken from within, we see the proportions of an epidemical ailment. So the ancients bega began their thought of life by recommending a twofold attitude. Man instinctively desiring to see the world around him and to solve its mystery, and also desiring to see a better world within himself and solve its mystery, may function in both regions, using each to symbolize the other, and both to attain the common good. It becomes a basic matter of placing his own attitudes under certain basic supervision. Without this supervision, he cannot achieve his end. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Oriental problem phase of this, we see the gradual development of certain gentle arts which increase, increase man's appreciation for the mysteries of universal life. In other words, as man begins to see the universe around him as a thing of beauty, he begins also to experience a change within him. It has been demonstrated that to the degree our own lives become harmless, the world appears harmless, and the psychic life becomes harmless within us. We have to constantly sustain these illusions by supporting them with each other. Therefore, if we begin to see nature as lawful and kind, we begin to gain a strength to penetrate the illusion within ourselves. This is the reason why I think the law of causality is so very, very important. Because if we believe, as the Buddhist believe, that there is an infinite justice, and that this justice is never wrong, that this justice is law, and this law is innate and inevitable. If we believe this, we slowly dispose of most of the demons with which the universe around us seems to be infested. And in Buddhism this happened in a very interesting way, because the old Buddhist priests going into foreign regions, finding all kinds of demons that were held in high revere, uh, promptly converted the demons first. And after that, the people became happy and the demons became good and faithful servants of the true doctrine. Now, uh, I, I don't remember very many instances in Western thinking where folks went out determined to convert the fallen angel. They didn't seem to start it that way. They wanted to defend themselves against evil. They didn't realize that it is perfectly possible to transform evil, that it is perfectly possible for evil to cease, simply through the inner understanding of the meaning of law and of lawfulness and of order and of the proprieties of things. In the same way, if we gradually come to the conviction that we live in an honest universe, it becomes almost inevitable that we must take the same attitude toward our own internal lives. The discovery of universal honesty presumes the presence of an inner honesty in ourselves. The moment we begin to be able to take the storms and the rains and the winds of the world around us and see that they are part of a divine plan, we also begin to organize the tempest within our own little teapot. Things change their appearances. Uh, we begin to get rid of the grudges. We begin to get rid of the antagonisms and the criticisms that can never do anything but hurt. And because we outgrow them, these dark areas within our own nature relax. And little by little, we do, it would seem, uh, redeem one by one of the lost spirits in our own purgatories. For well, these lost spirits are really phases of ourselves. They are the lost attitudes, uh, the useless and meaningless sorrows 
uh, with which we break up our own personalities into a whole race of suffering fragments, each afflicted with some attitude that is destructive to its common good. Thus, in a way, we put together the elements of the two worlds. We find out then why uh, it wasn't necessary for us to depend upon a knowledge of infinite space in order to put our own house in order. It is the growing up and the maturing of the, of the sense of the benevolence of things within ourselves. And this experience has to come as an experience, not as a known fact of outer living. If we were aware of every benevolence of the universe, and it could be scientifically proven, if we were certain of every law that existed, man would be denied of the greatest part of his own redemption. He would be denied of the right and the power to make the personal statement of good in the presence of shadows. He would lose the entire privilege, the magnificent opportunity of discovering that which he must discover and which he can discover only by his own effort. If it was all revealed to him, there would never be those hours in which he had to claim his own heritage of faith. There would never be those long nights in which he had to struggle with the weaknesses and infirmities of his own flesh. And yet without victories over these negations, voluntary victories, gained not because the truth was evident, but because the principle of right could be dimly perceived and must be obeyed. The individual then grows not by what is handed to him, but by what he achieves out of the smallness of his own insight. Knowing a little, he must make a good decision. By this he grows. But if he knew all, there would be no need for decision. And somewhere in this structure of man, the pattern says that he must grow through the gradual process of affirming the realities and having the courage to live by principles which he cannot prove, but which in his consciousness he knows to be true. This is the, this is the real challenge, that having projected a certain conviction, as Wallace cast the heart of Bruce into the battle, so man must follow this conviction and fulfill it. He must, with the small courage of partial insight, uh, meet the challenge of his own spiritual need. He does not accomplish this. In some way, his own growth is frustrated. To make this challenge inevitable, two things have to be present in nature. And the universe, visible or invisible, must keep these rules. One thing is, there cannot be anything out there in the unknown of space that can prevent man from achieving his own destiny. There can't be something out there with a hammer that can knock him down for no reason. There cannot be a vengeful spirit or an evil sprite that can in any way stand between the individual and that which is his proper destiny. Thus the invisible world around him cannot make him or break him. Whatever its contribution is, he will know in due time. But there is nothing out there that can take from his stature or add to it. If there was one thing utterly unknown to him and utterly beyond his control, which was amicable to his destiny, man would be completely frustrated. If there was a power greater than he is that was able to frustrate his achievement for reasons that are arbitrary or purposeless, or by whim, or by some temper of a deity, 
then the entire concept of cause and effect falls apart. So whatever there is that is there cannot be an interfering thing, nor can it be a solving thing. For if there is anything there that can solve man's problem without man earning solution, then he would be perfectly justified in assuming that he could elect a government that would represent him here, which he has never yet been able to do, and never will. If it was possible for anything else or anyone else to solve our problems, they would have been solved long ago. But the fact remains we must solve our own. So whatever the secondary powers, be they cherubic or demoniacal, so-called, whether they be imps or angels, whatever they are, they cannot interfere with the destiny of the individual or his right to be himself. Because to do so would imply that man is then a victim of something which his own sensory perceptions and his own reflective powers cannot cope with. And man is not expected to do the impossible. All that is required from, from him is a reasonable effort to fulfill not only the possible but the immediately necessary. If he will do what is next, all the rest will be forgiven him. So man must uh, not look upon this universe of things outside of him as menacing his growth or as fulfilling some weakness in himself so that he does not have to do these things. The invisible world is not a welfare state. The invisible world is not a place where you can reap without sowing or where you plow under every other row. In the universe, this invisible world is part of a great evolving structure. It is like a field of grain on the opposite side of the earth where we cannot see it, but it is growing by the same rules as the grain on this side of the earth. Everything is lawful. And the moment we begin to realize this, we do not have to fear the unknown. And as we reach the point where we no longer fear the unknown, we do not invest it with supernatural powers. Whatever its powers may be, for itself they are natural. <clears throat> Whatever these powers may be, it is inevitable that in the order of our way of life, they cannot exercise a supernatural effect upon us, or again they would interfere. So if they affect us at all, it is within the natural boundaries of our expectancies, conscious or unconscious. Perhaps they are affecting us, perhaps they help digest our food, perhaps they regulate the liver, we do not know. But whatever those forces are, they are normal and reasonable. They are not destructive, they are not angry, they are not evil. They can do nothing to prevent us from achieving, nor can they make our achievement inevitable. So against this background, the individual must follow the admonition of the wise and work out his own salvation with diligence. He must work out his salvation perfectly certain that the universe around him will cooperate with his own labor. That as he fulfills his responsibilities and his duties, the laws working through space reward him in right measure. Therefore, that in this space that we do not see or understand, there are the workings of laws. These laws rewarding everything according to its achievements according to its motives, according to its insight, and its dedications. And that which is itself without purpose is rewarded in that way, without purpose. So whatever we think of, we can think of a world of creatures all about the business of their own growth, which is the proper business of existence. And we can also think of this space as filled with the manifestations of those universal laws 
by which the dignities and securities of all lives are preserved and protected. Whatever comes out of space is honest. Whatever comes out of the invisible is the ever-working of the law. Whatever other things may exist in space, which have no relation to man at the moment, these other things fulfill their destinies, but they do not impinge upon us. If we can get, kind of get this thought thoroughly set in our own minds, we will not ask space for favors, though we'll be build defenses in our own minds against the strange darkness that lurks there. We will accept space just as we accept night, as the unseen part of a common world, and that in this night there are creatures that belong to the night, and in the day there are creatures that belong to the day, that the alternation of day and night is essential to the regulation of nature. So all things fulfill themselves in their proper sequences and in their proper patterns. Man has no reason to fear. And uh, it is interesting to realize that uh, when you travel into other parts of the world, uh, you find uh, the invisible universe around us. Uh, come sometimes very close in the belief and attitudes of peoples. Down in the Balkan areas, for example, there are many superstitions and beliefs uh, which we do not share here. If you go and live in those regions long enough, you find these beliefs closing in upon you. First thing you know, the ignorance of those people begins to give you a haunted world. And you begin to see all the mysterious creatures uh, of their peculiar folklore and legendary and demonology. If you stay there long enough, you will believe them all. And perhaps you will even see some of them. And you will hear the banshees crying in the night. And you will actually see werewolves if you're not very careful. But then you come back to your own home again in a more prosaic community, and in a few months this all fades out, and you say to yourself, how could I ever have believed this? Therefore, we do say that in an atmosphere uh, where we are influenced negatively, we begin to visualize and, re and project out of our own subconscious the fulfillment of any attitude that slowly takes possession of the mind. This is the reason why it is very important to us philosophically and religiously to make sure that every attitude that does dominate our thinking is a just one, is a reasonable and lawful attitude, and that at all times we instinctively turn to the unknown and bless it and not curse it. And we can only reach this instinct where within ourselves we have ceased to curse anything. Uh, where we have gradually learned to experience the inner part of ourselves as beautiful and experience all other people as fulfilling their natural destinies and growing according to their lights and their ways. And that little by little all hatreds, all dissonances, all discords vanish from our own consciousness. The moment this happens to the individual, he can no longer be the victim of obsessing demons or horrible dreams, nor can he be terrified by the night, nor can he look around him in the world and uh, not knowing the thinking of other people begin to suspect that all these people are terrible and hateful creatures. Sometimes perhaps he is wrong. Perhaps some of these people are not quite as good as he thought they were. But his own health, his own survival, his own integration demands that in his own heart he keeps seeking until he finds the good. He cannot acknowledge the evil in anything without acknowledging it in himself. So all this problem of working back and forth, of creating strange fantasies of sleep and dreams, of nightmares and all these things, result also gradually in the building up of collective patterns. And in these patterns, as we see them working in the world today, 
we see negative patterns gaining strength all the time from the common misunderstandings and false attitudes of people. These patterns become customary, but regardless of how many hold the pattern, amongst the substances of the subconscious are contaminated. There cannot be one person contaminated who does not accept the pattern himself and permit it. No matter how prevalent the evil is, each individual must accept that evil and be infected by it through some action of his own. He cannot receive this evil because another million has it. He can only be partake of this evil if he has corrupted his own integrity in some way. So there is no power in nature or in the universe that can hurt the individual who has not opened himself to being hurt by a disobedience of the natural laws of benevolence. If we keep this constantly in our thoughts, we will not be so subject to hauntings and things of that nature, and life in general will enable us to get along with those we can see and also the ones we cannot see in a reasonably pleasant manner. And this is something greatly to be desired. Because sometimes our worst enemies are shadows. And some individuals suffer acutely uh, from their inability to discover the magnificent integrity at the root of life. These are the ones perhaps who suffer the most. It is hard to find a friend who is false. But it is much more difficult to live in a universe that seems to be false. But fortunately, the universe can never be false except in seeming, for in substance it is always true. And the individual who is able uh, to hold this attitude and work gradually to finding this truth will in the same time put both the universe and his adversary in their proper places. He will be free from both evils. So that uh, from the universe we learn something of ourselves, and from ourselves we learn something of the universe. And this is apparently as far as we're supposed to go, and I think it's probably far enough to go for the first evening. So thank you very kindly.